I think to get at the question of what uh, human intentionality is, uh, um, I think uh, if brain states are correlated uh, with intentions, and we can show that, then we have a way to argue for a certain kind of human freedom. Right now, neuroscience tells us that, uh, hu that we are determined that it's all about the brain that's doing the work in the world. There's really no intentionality, there's no freedom of the, of the person, him or herself, to actually carry out an action. And it's all the neurons that are doing it. And I think what's really interesting about this sort of conference and this sort of research program that's being launched here is that we can reconsider that question and actually uh, open, open this whole field of research up again and say it has not been resolved, free will has not been disproven. In fact, human, maybe there's still a possibility left that science in the future can show us that there is a role for consciousness, for agency uh, in the act of acting in the world. And I think this is the biggest promise you know, for, for this particular field. Well, I, I, I guess one, one promise is just to, to get clarity for these perennial uh, questions, because uh, it, these are, you know, there's the traditional question of free will in a deterministic physical world and, and, uh, and related issues. And I, I, think, uh, I think now the hope is that somehow we could, could uh, understand maybe the relation of cognitive, mental, conscious phenomena and the underlying neural phenomena. And, and when we're doing that, we're also trying to clarify many of the concepts. You know, what do we mean by freedom? What do we me mean by will? And how do these co connect with all the kind of things, intentions and various other things that, that we can also look from the neuroscientific point of view? So uh, the biggest promise, I think, is that it might enable us to make people more free. Uh, so it might enable us to identify um, deficits in freedom, um, may enable us to understand ways in which human beings um, aren't, aren't as free as we could be. Um, so it might enable us to uh, um, exacerbate or uh, develop our, our freedom in, in, in new and interesting ways. I think free will is not a single notion. I think it's a whole array of different notions. And I think we've tried to tease those apart philosophically. And I think we've tried to tease them apart with psychology. And I think now neuroscience is going to come in and help us complete that picture. So I think this is one of the most exciting uh, and fundamental challenges of uh, all time. And I think that if we can understand the uh, neural mechanisms by which the brain orchestrates volition and, and free will, uh, this will have a tremendous impact uh, uh, on our legal system, on our social interactions, on clinical conditions such as uh, addiction and other disorders of uh, volition and free will, uh, and also in how we think about ourselves and even in artificial intelligence and how to design uh, robots and sentient systems uh, with a, which, who are morally responsible. Uh, to me, it's a, a great area uh, that brings together our scientific uh, attempts to understand the world and a more humanistic vision, uh, and in particular, uh, our understanding of ourselves. Uh, so. Uh, so that's a question I'm not going to answer because I'm a philosopher rather than a neuroscience. To neuroscientist, so I don't know what the biggest promise is of the neuroscience of free will. So the biggest promise in my mind is to uh, get some sense of consciousness. Uh, consciousness is the sort of leading question almost in neuroscience at the moment. Uh, it, it's not understood at all. And I think uh, the, the study of free will might be a channel into the understanding of consciousness, which I think would be very valuable. And of course, the understanding of free will itself is valuable as uh, relevant for uh, neurological patients, uh, for issues of responsibility. There's lots of things that uh, uh, the understanding of free will itself will be helpful for. I think the biggest premise is based on the idea that free will is really the ability to act freely, and so uh, whatever light neuroscientists can shed on action, uh, 
that is how actions are produced, will uh, ultimately help us understand free will. The biggest promise of the neuroscience of free will is that we can start to bring in contact of our age-old philosophical thinking uh, about free will with interesting experimental data. So uh, while I don't think it's the case that uh, neuroscience will just be able to answer the question of whether we have free will or not, um, because very often neuroscientists are like uh, all normal people, uh, lay people about the questions of what uh, philosophical concepts of free will are, uh, but what they can do is, philosophers don't had, didn't have the experimental data uh, when they started theorizing for 2,000 years, and using this experimental data make, makes a difference to the answers that we want to give to these questions. So it's a bit like a reflective equilibrium. We can, uh, the data can change our intuitions, and then we can use our intuitions for a philosophical conceptualizing, and that again, in context, can, can make for better neuroscience, and the neuroscience can change better intuitions and so on. Well, I think, I guess I think the biggest promise is that we might be able to figure out whether or not uh, people have anything like the kinds of capacities for control over their behavior that we ordinarily think we have and that we presuppose that we have when we make judgments of responsibility. So I think one of the big promises is the fact that we now um, try to collaborate or to form a platform in which uh, philosophers and other scientists could work together and find new ways to um, answer one of the most intriguing questions in, in the history of thought, which is basically, are human beings free? And if we are, what does that mean? And how can we uh, examine that scientifically or empirically? Um, so to me, the most exciting thing is that we are trying to stop and uh, ask this question in separate ways in different disciplines, but we are trying to collaborate and find a way to do it together as a community that is not uh, limited to one uh, line of research or um, a typical discipline, but actually trying to work together in collaboration um, along these lines. I think the biggest promise is the coming of the bringing of the data discovered by scientists into the field where the problems have been discussed very abstractly before. These problems that two philosophers uh, have been completely divorced from the actual uh, structure and functioning of the brain are now actually being addressed in ways that take account uh, facts that have been discovered by scientific inquiry about uh, the structure and um, functioning of the brain and therefore these these discussions by philosophers and neuroscientists actually have some content now I mean it's, it's very really it's very difficult to answer this question because the answer is so obvious so I've just given you this extremely obvious answer and I'm sorry but this extremely obvious thing to say is the only thing I have to say well, the biggest promise would, of course, be if we could uh, determine whether we have a free will or not. Um, but uh, maybe we won't be able to say definitely or give a definite answer within this uh, rather short period. But we might at, uh, at least challenge the, the common view that uh, free will is an illusion. I think this is a big uh, promise for this project. To, to give a more nuanced uh, view on, on the problem of free will. I think the biggest promise of neuroscience of free will is to move beyond the behaviorist tradition, which really dominated mind sciences and also brain sciences in the 20th century, which treated our behavior as being merely a result of the external environment in which we found ourselves. And it seemed as though having a mind or having a brain really added very little to our basic reflex responding under that framework. So the, the real excitement of a neuroscience of free will at the moment is to understand what it is that our minds supply for our behavior. We're not merely reflex organisms.
And that's a new perspective in mind sciences, and I think it's an exciting one. I think the group that's working on the neuroscience of free will is sometimes working on free will, but the real promise lies in understanding the relationship between minds and brains. You know, this has baffled people for a long time. And if we can figure out how our mental states, our choices, our desires, our feelings, our beliefs are instantiated in the brain, we'll be, have made big pr progress on that. And the second thing is to understand how those mental states might cause the physical states. How does my choice cause my hand to move? That's a big mystery, and I think neuroscience can help. Conceptual clarity, I think, is one thing that uh, uh, we're lacking a bit, especially in neuroscience. So we don't agree on what free will is. I think by working together with philosophers, we'll have a better idea uh, conceptually of what free will is, and uh, that will make it uh, more feasible for us to actually do experiments. I think that this field is interesting because uh, free will has been opined upon, researched, been a substrate of scholarship for philosophers for millennia. I, uh, and then about 35 years ago, neuroscientists joined the debate. Um, and I think initially neuroscientists thought that they can just, uh, they're going to figure it out experimentally really quickly. They're going to do one nice experiment and it's going to be done and we're going to be, uh, we're going to be all good. Then we're going to figure out if we have free will or not, uh, roughly speaking. And I think that um, as neuroscientists, philosophers have started talking to each other a bit more, neuroscientists have figured out that the answer is more, or the question of do we have free will is much more complex. It's not something we can answer just in one fell swoop. Um, we will need more. Uh, it's very nuanced. It's complex. And that they would need the help of philosophers to make progress. And I think philosophers have understood that neuroscientists have something to contribute to the debate that they've been involved in for, for millennia. So I think the promise of uh, this joint work between philosophers and neuroscientists is progress on the question. Not necessarily an answer, yes, we have free will, no, we don't have free will. I'm not even sure that it's, it's such a binary answer as possible. Um, I think... Um, that we will be able to answer sub-questions within this debate. For instance, um, say more about um, to what extent our brain enables uh, conscious control of our decisions and actions. Um, we might be able to say more about arbitrary versus deliberate decisions and things of that nature. And I think, at least at this point, that that is the promise of the field of neuroscience of uh, free will or neurophil of free will. I think that many people uh, in a scientific community, especially neuroscientists, uh, uh, basically will say that since the Libet type experiments in the 1980s, um, that this question has been resolved that actually you know we know that the brain is acting and it's not there is no other sort of uh, causal power independent of the physical world that that's uh, performing this action and I think there's a there's, uh, if you read the textbooks that's really the attitude in general and so I think uh, what's happening here is to kind of kind of uh, get about challenging that basic assumption you know in the field and opening up completely new possibilities of reconsidering uh you know what was learned so far well, I, I i guess one one promise is just to to get clarity for these perennial uh questions because uh, it, these are you know there is the traditional question of free will in a deterministic physical world and and uh, and related issues and i i think uh, I think now the hope is that somehow we could could uh, understand maybe the relation of the cognitive, mental, conscious phenomena and the underlying neural phenomena. And, and when we're doing that, we're also trying to clarify many of the concepts. You know, what do we mean by freedom? What do we mean by will? 
and how do these co connect with all the kind of things, intentions and various other things that, that we can also look from the neuroscientific point of view. So I think there are, there are two real central challenges. One is so many different conceptions of, of, of free will. Um, that's obviously a problem. Um, the other problem is uh, understanding mapping relations between um, personal level descriptions, descriptions of, of agents in terms of intentions, in terms of emotions, goals, um, feelings of agency on the one hand. So mapping between that level of description and a, a neural level of description. Um, these are very different languages. Um, and to really understand how freedom emerges from neural activity, um, you need some way to, to, to map between them. And that's, that's a serious challenge. So there are obviously two sorts of challenges, I think. One is the obvious experimental challenge to um, try and get a grip experimentally on how to test the notions there. But I think there's also a great deal of conceptual work that needs to be done first. I think you're not going to just read free will off from the brain. So I think that working out how to couch the difficulties is one of the major issues for free will. One of the big problems uh, in our field is uh, uh, our intuitions that sometimes uh, get in the way, as well as many of our dogmatic views uh, about, the, about the problem. Some of the answers about volition uh, may be uh, uncomfortable. Uh, it may be hard for us to accept uh, that uh, we're nothing but a pack of neurons, that our volition is purely and completely dictated by physical phenomena and by neuronal interactions, in the same way that people were extremely uncomfortable uh, about thinking that uh, the Earth went around the sun uh, in, uh, rather than the other way around. So our internal beliefs, our, our, our internal dogmas, and how to challenge them uh, is, is perhaps one of the biggest challenges that we have now. The greatest challenge is um, that we need to resist the temptation to oversimplify. Um, neuroscience has made uh, a lot of strides in the past several decades, uh, but there are still vast amounts that are not understood, and so there's always going to be a temptation uh, for theorists in trying to understand and model the human brain to uh, either downplay or, or deny altogether the reality of that which um, they can't readily uh, fit within current models of thinking. So I think uh, it's in, uh, in a field that requires a lot of patience because I think we, we do understand a lot about ourselves from a simple reflection on our own. Uh, experience of acting and how to fit that together with the, the kinds of models that neuroscience um, seeks to deliver of mechanisms that implement uh, the things that we experience. Um, uh, it's going to take a while before we, we have a satisfying way of even understanding how to bring those two together. So the greatest challenge really is the understanding of consciousness. I don't think people have much idea about it at all at, at the moment. Uh, we don't have any good scientific way of understanding exactly what's happening. So that in order to understand free will, or free will being a aspect of consciousness in my view, uh, it makes it difficult. There obviously are ways that we can study it. Uh, it, in my view, again, it's a brain state and we should be able to understand brain states, but exactly how the brain state translates into something that we can be aware of is a, is a very difficult matter. I think the greatest challenges are probably deciding exactly what we want to test, what theses or propositions we want to test, and then how to test them. So, uh, decision about what we want to learn, and then decisions about how to learn it. Well, it's the translation problem between uh, two different fields. I, it, there's, there are already very many problems if you want to, do, to speak between different empirical sciences. Uh, and obviously philosophy and neuroscience have very, very different traditions, very different vocabularies, uh, and they often do not translate into each other. Uh, there's also um, clearly, simply, uh, people are uh, quite sensitive uh, to being told by people in other disciplines 
uh, that they're doing something wrong, they react even more hostile uh, to criticism than they would to colleagues in their own field. Uh, and that makes uh, discussions between disciplines very difficult. Um, the biggest challenge is probably communication between neuroscientists and philosophers. Uh, neuroscientists tackle these problems largely by thinking about what they can measure um, and they want to set aside discussion of qualities and properties of people that they can't measure, that they have no idea how to measure, where philosophers think very openly and freely about what kinds of properties people ordinarily think their actions have, and they don't worry about whether or not those are properties that they can measure. Um, so trying to find, to kind of translate and find common ground, turning philosophical concepts into ones that are actually operationalizable is very difficult and a major challenge for the field, I think. So I think uh, a, a huge challenge is to understand the question. Um, so this is a, a, a question that has been circling in different circles uh, and wearing different types of um, forms, um, depending on who's been asking the question and how he or she has been asking it. And I think one of the biggest challenges is to understand the terms that we are using and to make the questions that we are asking as accurate as possible and as uh, informative as possible. And I think what we, need to know, what we need to do as a first step is to formalize our questions and uh, find the best way to ask them. And that, in my opinion, or this is at least my hope, would allow us to uh, do better science and better philosophy. It's very difficult to make any sense when you talk about free will. There are challenges that have to do with concepts that are not well defined and which people who talk about them, and this happens with both scientists and philosophers, people who, t who talk in terms of these concepts don't really understand that the terms that they're using don't have any clear meaning. And I should say this is a purely, this is my own personal opinion, not everybody uh, who's an expert in this area will agree with me on that. For example, I don't think anybody has any very clear sense of what they mean by the term free will. I don't think that anybody has any very clear sense of what they mean by the term conscious volition. There are all sorts of terms uh, that are thrown back and forth by people discussing this problem as if they understood them and I think they do think they understand them, and I don't think that the terms really mean much. They're not technical terms from the sciences. They're not ordinary terms from everyday life. They're just terms that are sort of in the air. Uh, and I think getting clear, getting clear definitions, precise renderings of these terms, that is the single biggest challenge that faces the field. I think it is to, to link the different levels of uh, understanding uh, from what happens at the neuronal level uh, to the network level and to the mental level. Uh, so to link the different levels of uh, brain, mind uh, aspects, uh, phenomena, uh, and see the interaction between the different levels, not only from bottom up, but also, and more particularly, the top down. I mean, how can mental processes affect material, neural processes? I think this is a big and probably the biggest challenge. I think the biggest problem in trying to study the neuroscience of free will is we can't use our conventional scientific methods. So. Normally in science, when you want to study something, you treat the thing that you're studying as a black box and you manipulate the inputs and you measure the outputs. And the whole idea about, quote, free will, unquote, is that our actions are up to us. They're not driven by any external input. They're not driven by the environment. So what that means is that you don't have an input that you can easily manipulate. And that means that you can't use the standard method of studying the mind as a black box. So we lack good methods for understanding how 
volition, I'm not sure I like the term free will, but how volition works. And I think the biggest challenge right now is coming up with convincing and rigorous scientific methods. I think one big challenge is just getting neuroscientists and philosophers together. They often mean totally different things by intention or by belief or by action. Uh, and sometimes they're just talking past each other. Uh, and that's a real challenge. More substantively, I think the biggest challenge is to try to get equipment that will reach all the different parameters at the same time. You need fMRI with its spatial location. You need EEG with its temporal uh, location to be able to get the precision on the timing and the spatial location uh, to understand what's going on. And I think it's a real challenge to get those together uh, and make them work you know, in a single experiment. Ditto. <laughs> Conceptual clarity. So being able to define operationally what is free will uh, so that we can uh, so that we can study it empirically about um, to what extent our brain enables uh, conscious control of our decisions and actions um, we might be able to say more about arbitrary versus deliberate decisions and things of that nature and I think at least at this point that that is the promise of the field of neuroscience of uh, free will or neurophil of free will. What are the greatest challenges that you think this field faces? Uh, th so this field, some of the potential for success is also potential for, for challenges. Um, this field, as I said, uh, incorporates both uh, philosophers and neuroscientists trying to work together these are different disciplines with different uh, different ways of of talking, thinking, uh, having conferences, and and so on. Um, neuroscientists typically have an experiment, and they argue about what is the right experiment to do, and what is the interpretation, and so on. Um, um, f philosophers typically have great suggestions for perhaps experiments or for how to understand the question and so on. Um, they have less knowledge about how, uh, how to run experiments and things of that nature, how to control them properly from a, a, an empirical standpoint. standpoint. So um, it could easily be the case that the philosophers, for instance, could get frustrated while they're waiting for months without end on the neuroscientists to come back with some data from their experiment. Um, that's uh, one thing. It could be that the philosophers and the neuroscientists don't really talk, uh, talk to each other. They kind of talk above each other in different levels, and we don't really get a dialogue going. Um, it could be that it becomes just a shouting match about uh, um, no, you don't respect data, no, you don't respect what the concepts are rather than trying to really work together because it's hard. These are different disciplines. It takes a lot of time and effort for, um, for, for people from different disciplines to, to really work together. Uh, oh, that's a really difficult question. Uh, I, I think many people would say uh, it, it might be, by def that question might be by definition beyond empirical experimentation. That's why, you know, many people believe the notion of free will really is a philosophical concept only. And, um, and all the proposals I've heard so far on how to empirically investigate the notion of free will are not really very convincing yet. Um, so uh, I think it will, this is an essential question to be asked you know, in this research program, whether actually any progress can be made uh, uh, exactly on that question. Because uh, right now, uh, I think all the experimental proposals on free will are more proposals about trying to find correlations for intentionality in the brain. Uh, but even if you find those correlations in the brain, uh, does that mean we have really advanced on the question of free will? And I think that's a totally open question, whether this can be done. Well, I think we're going to see in this conference, we're going to see many, many examples uh, of that. But of course, we um, I think first 
it, it means to get clear on what is meant by by the free will and there are you know, many different definitions are being given and and uh, some of the early experiments that Libet did back in 1983 then people were asked to do something like move their hand when they kind of felt like this and of course later on people have criticized well that's not really what what we in ordinarily like common sense mean by free will sometimes you know if we are making important decisions in our lives and you know th those kinds of big things it's very different from the kinds of uh, maybe contrived situations we we sometimes do with experimental studies so so i think if we can uh, if we can uh, study more do experiments where people are more real life situations this would be an advance so one way to probe it, I mean, there are many ways, um, but one way to probe it is to look at disorders of volition, where people seem to be performing voluntary actions, seem to have some intentional control over their behavior, um, but feel as though they don't. So the feeling of agency is in some way disturbed, uh, some way undermined, um, some way impaired. And to understand what's going on in the brain, what's going on in cognitive structures, such that um, there's this dissociation between uh, volitional control and, and the feeling of volitional control? That's not an easy question. I think that, as I said earlier, there are a lot of different themes that come in with free will. There are themes from moral responsibility at one end through to motor skills and the experience of agency from motor skills. So I think that um, breaking those issues down in such a way as to make them experimentally tractable is not a is not a straightforward thing to do. Um, so I think it has to be done step by step. And I think, as always with these things, it's it's something where you have some results that you think might bear on something, and then you work back again. So it's a sort of process of triangulation, I think, between philosophers, psychologists, neuroscientists, to come up with the the, the right ways of, of of addressing the questions. So I'm uh, very excited about the possibility of uh, interrogating the neuronal mechanisms uh, by which free will is orchestrated uh, in brain circuits. Uh, an example of this uh, that was uh, quite influential is the Libet type of paradigm. And although there has been a lot of discussion and a lot of criticism about the experimental paradigm, about the implications of the results, uh, about the interpretation of what that means, I think that that's an example uh, as to how we can begin to jointly design uh, uh, adequate experiments and we can begin to probe uh, the neural mechanisms, both in animal models as well as in the human brain, uh, to try to correlate and eventually find causal uh, relationships between neural activity and uh, intentions, uh, volition, and the process of decision making. That's a challenging question. <laughs> and um, uh, I, I think it, uh, it, it's to make fruitful uh, experimental exploration, it's got to be broken down into a lot of smaller questions of using our intuitive understanding of what it would be to act freely to guide um, what, uh, experimenters in beginning to try to, to look for um, processes, mechanisms that um, might uh, suggestively point in the direction, um, either pro or con, uh, our, our, our understanding of ourselves. So it's, I, I don't think we're at a point right now where we can just take the big concept of free will and say, all right, let's run an experiment uh, or, or a series of experiments that uh, can either directly confirm or disconfirm uh, the reality of this. Um, uh, too much is not well understood. Uh, for that to be possible. So um, it has to be, we have to go small and piecemeal. Uh, and I think that's easier for neuroscientists who are, are used to trying to break down complicated problems into smaller, tractable, empirically tractable problems uh, than for philosophers who, who uh, typically want to always keep our eye firmly on the big picture. That's a great question. Um, it seems to me 
we need, need to uh, think hard about what we mean by free will. And uh, so Uri's suggestion was that maybe there are requirements on it that then could be um, studied uh, experimentally. Um, maybe that will work. Um, but it, it, that seems like another hard question. I will have answers eventually. So, uh, the, uh, so the idea of free will uh, must in some way be embedded in the brain. And to, uh, we have a lot of good tools now for studying the brain. Uh, we can do EEG studies, uh, we can do fMRI studies, there are a whole variety of ways that we can get some, some sense about uh, uh, how the brain is actually processing things that will in fact relate to free will. So I, I think that that is an aspect which uh, makes it more tractable to understand than perhaps some other features of consciousness. Well, you can uh, bring free will down to earth. So <clears throat> imagine you think it's uh, the ability to act freely, and then imagine that you had some definition of free action. And if you had a definition of free action of a certain kind, uh, you could figure out a way to test whether we ever do that kind of thing, whether we act freely. Um, there are different ways of conceiving of free action. Some are relatively simple. They don't require more than being well-informed and sane and uh, making a reasonable decision on the basis of good information. It's easy enough to see that that actually happens. It gets harder the more you add to the mix uh, required for free action. Um, but we'll see how that goes. Well, directly, I don't think it can be. Um, so I think there is a lot of work that needs to be done, uh, careful uh, conceptual work, before we can start to make design sensible experiments that tell us something about the nature of free will. So it is a, a philosopher's job uh, to give us a clue about what we think we should mean by free will, or which aspects of free will uh, we might be testing. Uh, and then once we break down the concept of free will into concepts like intentions, conscious control, um, different types of intentions, then we can start make, designing experiments that can test these, in these uh, concepts which are already a lot closer uh, to the neuroscientific world. So we need a, a, to translate a concept which is, doesn't only exist in the philosophy of mind world, but is obviously a, a moral philosophy concept as well, uh, into a concept that sits more squarely in the philosophy of mind context uh, and a testable concept. And then we can start uh, making uh, experimental, uh, design good experiments uh, in order to make progress with the more abstract notion. So, I mean, I think there's a million ways to go after it. Um, and I don't think it's actually harder than other abstract notions that we probe experimentally all the time. So belief is an abstract notion, but we probe it experimentally. Um, many, many examples. And uh, so pretty much wherever you have a psychological concept, uh, there's a question as to if you've got, you're dealing with something fairly abstract, and then the question is how to go about examining it in um, an experimental setting. So I think there's tons of ways of going about it. Um, yeah, I, I, yeah, there's too many ways to, too many ways to list in the same way as for any other kind of highly abstract notion. So I think this is indeed one of the greatest challenges, how to take this concept or this term and try to break it into smaller uh, questions and how to formalize it in uh, empirical uh, ways. What we try to do in our work is to focus on uh, deliberate or meaningful decisions, so not decisions that are completely random or arbitrary and have little bearing on what we do in everyday lives. So we try to examine the question of volition by uh, focusing on typical decisions that you might have made you know in a typical day trying to ask where in that process volition comes into play well it's difficult when you don't know as i've suggested what free will is but there are questions about free will and determinism that can certainly be probed experimentally uh, for example the more you can predict human behavior, uh, 
uh, from physical antecedent conditions, uh, the better the evidence is that human actions are determined. Or if you could actually conduct experiments that show what the Libet experiments claimed to show, uh, that there are antecedents of human actions uh, that are uh, purely physical, that are not susceptible of conscious introspection, and that these occur well before a conscious decision to act, that tells us a lot that's relevant to questions of, of voluntary control of action. So a lot of empirical data can be collected. It's certainly relevant to the problem of free will. The problem is finding ways to make it clear what its relevance is. Well, I think that uh, first we have to find a, a sort of a neural correlate of free will or conscious free will. Um, and that is, uh, if we can find some way to, uh, to link our sense of free will with some neural correlate, like synchronous oscillations, which I think is a good candidate, uh, then we can make experiments that measure how the neural activity changes depending on our experience of free will and uh, when we exercise free will. So I think the biggest challenge in trying to produce experimental studies of free will is trying to combine in a single experiment all the different things that people want out of a theory of volition and a theory of free will. So in philosophy, for example, people always say, oh, voluntary actions are the actions that you make for a reason. So we need to have a reason why somebody would make a movement or make an action during an experiment. And in neurophysiology, we say that the critical thing about a voluntary action is the particular brain circuits that trigger the muscle contraction that make us move. And I think one of the real uh, difficulties for producing experiments is getting all of these different elements which seem to contribute to what we mean by volition into a single experiment. All we can do at the moment is design an experiment which addresses some of what we mean by free will, but perhaps not everything. Well, that's hard, of course, because it's so abstract, as you say. It actually means different things. Uh, if we want to understand what causes wills, then we have to get causal relations. That means we have to manipulate things. If we want to figure out what causes what, we need to manipulate the cause and see if the effect changes at the same time. So now that means we need to be able to manipulate consciousness. We need to be able to manipulate beliefs. We need to be able to manipulate desires and hopes and dreams when you start talking about big actions. Uh, and so that's you know really difficult to do, to change people's beliefs, desires, consciousness in an experimental setting. Um. That's tricky. Um, pass. <laughs> well, the notion of free will has been probed experimentally since the Libet experiment and perhaps before. Um, however, um, how to do it correctly is difficult because of the things I mentioned before. This is a complex field, it's very nuanced. I think the right way to go about this is to really try to make sure that the concepts that we're studying are the uh, concepts that make sense to study. The kind of experiments that we're doing are not just well controlled, but they're also asking the right question that if we get a specific answer to that question, it would not just convince uh, uh, neuroscientists, but actually convince philosophers that we have made some progress uh, uh, in the field. I mean, it's going to be, it's, uh, I'll give you an example of something that we have done. Um, one question that keeps on coming up uh, for, for us was, well, in the Libet experiment, uh, you can perhaps predict whether a person is going to go like this or go like that, but in some sense, who cares? You're just sitting there and you're saying, you know, raise one of your hands. So I can predict which hand you're going to raise from your brain activity. So what? Um, a more important question, in our opinion, is can I predict that when these 
when these um, movements are meaningful. Raise your right hand if you want to donate to charity A. Raise your left hand if you want to donate to charity B. Something like that. Now your hand, now your movements uh, um, are, are meaningful. Um, there's reason behind them, and so on. Um, and this kind of experiment, we reached, uh, we reached this experiment after a lot of debates with philosophers. So um, we now think that the result that, that we would get from an experiment like that would be a value not just to neuroscientists but to philosophers as well. And I think that's the kind of experiments that, that uh, we would need to make progress in the field. I think this is one of the most innovative aspects of this program uh, because scientists, including neuroscientists, uh, they need to get guidance on the use of terms, concepts, ideas, and philosophers are particularly well trained in uh, defining terms, in defining distinctions, and in uh, really making the case for or against based on logic on certain types of arguments. And scientists, especially empirical scientists, are really not trained to do so. So I think the interaction between neuroscientists and philosophers, in particular on the question of free will, is absolutely crucial to have any hope for making an advance in the future. Well, well I think the, in this case, both fields can really, really benefit from, from this uh, enterprise. I think maybe what, what philosophers tend to do, they give great attention to concepts and how, you know, the con same concept can be used in many different ways. So I think the philosopher's task is to really be very sensitive to the way, you know, are we talking about the same thing? Are we talking about the different things? And of course, then when we go and do the experiments, then, then there again, you know, what is it actually, what are we actually studying experimentally here? And, but on the other, other direction, I think also uh, uh, neuroscientists can, can often provide very interesting data that, uh, that would uh, challenge some philosophical theories and, and uh, often um, in, in some ways the most interesting research combines them both and, and you could, you know, neuroscientists could come up with some data that kind of even contradicts some philosophical theories. So those are always good opportunities for progress. Well, let me start with the challenges. The challenges is uh, we have different training. We often understand, um, we often use the same words, but we use them in different ways. We understand different things by them. Um, and we, we come at things from different perspectives. So that's a challenge. Um, in a sense, that's also an opportunity because we can see things, we, each side will see things that the others uh, don't see. I think philosophers have a special um, appreciation for the links or the, the, the nuance of our everyday way of thinking about free will and the legal, moral, political ramifications of that, um, that that neuroscientists don't always have. The neuroscientists, of course, understand the, the, the mechanics of, of human agency and human action. Um, they're in a position to, to, to understand if, how the machinery works and, and what um, impact probing and uh, intervening on this part of the machinery is going to have on, on human behavior. I mean, the advantages are obvious that you, you can really start to look at the mechanisms that are there. And I think sometimes we find when we look for the mechanisms that they're actually completely unlike we thought. So we're just wrong about how human beings work. I'd be surprised if that happens in the case of free will, but I think it's an open question. I think I think it may be. Um, so the um, great advantages, the, 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 the great success you might have is when, when you realize um, that something you had thought might be real turns out to be real in a very specific way. So I think we're looking at, so to give some examples of that, um, issues around the perception, the phenomenology of freedom, what it likes, what it feels like to be doing something free. I'm not sure philosophers have ever had a very good idea of that. There's some vague thought behind it. And I think that's something where the neuroscience might really help us find out about it. I'm very, very excited about the possibility of interacting with uh, philosophers. I'm a physicist uh, turned uh, neuroscientist. Uh, 
uh, there are about five decades that I need to catch up with in terms of understanding uh, neuroscience, uh, and there are uh, five centuries, uh, if not five millennia, of, of the history of uh, philosophy. So I think that collaborating and working to, alongside with philosophers is, is very important. Philosophers have a, uh, a way of uh, posing the right questions, of helping us uh, find the logical flaws in our thinking, uh, helping us interpret the results, uh, and, and, and sort of correcting us when we're over-interpreting the results of our uh, uh, experiment. So I think that this uh, synergistic collaboration between neuroscientists and philosophers is, uh, is, is particularly important. Uh, there are lots of challenges ahead as well. So one of them is the, the type of jargon that we use that sometimes is difficult. It's very hard to keep up with, uh, with, with advances in, in philosophy and in neuroscience at the same, uh, at the same time. Uh, and again, sometimes we, we come to the question with our own preconceived uh, ideas of how things work. We, we have our own internal uh, religion or dogma uh, uh, about how things work. And I think moving us, uh, both philosophers as well as neuroscientists, moving us uh, away from those preconceived notions uh, and those intuitions uh, is, is extremely challenging. So I think that's one of the, the biggest barriers to progress right now. Well, the, the advantage is it... it, uh, it we're, we're, hmm. the neuroscientists are sort of at the bottom level of the study of human behavior. That's about the, the kind of deepest level science um, that directly impinges on uh, human action and then on up through uh, more cognitive psychological sciences. And then philosophers are at the most general and abstract. They're just reflecting, uh, or at least they start from uh, simply reflecting on our ordinary experience of ourselves as as beers and doers in the world uh, and so the advantage of bringing uh, both philosophers and neuroscientists into conversation with one another is that each can discipline the other i think philosophers can um, can bring to the table uh, an understanding of the richness of the phenomena so to help keep neuroscientists from uh, oversimplification of, of uh, what it is that they're trying to study. And neuroscientists bring a kind of hard physical science discipline uh, to the study of these questions. So um, it's, it's fruitful because there's tension in, uh, um, and both sides are pushing the other to um, see the limits of the, of, uh, the, the this methodological approaches that they are used to. Uh, so I think the advantages are uh, great. I mean, I, th I think that, that we're both trying to study something that um, is important to people and that is um, worth studying in both in both ways, both philosophically and um, and experimentally. Um, the challenge, I think, is in um, was twofold at least, probably more. Uh, one, which I thought was evident from today's session, is getting people to use the same terms to mean the same things. So today we heard people talking about um, uh, intentions as uh, intentions as forward-looking, but agency as backward-looking. That was a thing that one of the um, one of the experimenters said. That that's a completely new use of those terms to me. Um, uh, and there's a couple other things that, that even just being on the same page uh, and understanding one another seems like a challenge. Um, and then trying to identify the question that we're going to be experimentally um, probing. That, that was actually your second question. or uh, can, That would have been my answer to your second question. What are the greatest challenges the field faces? I think it's probably identifying questions that can be um, that can be uh, pursued in a sustained and systematic way. I think that this has been a uh, terrific collaboration. Uh, philosophers, uh, in, in my experience, uh, first of all, to make clear I'm a neuroscientist on that side of the uh, of the issue, but uh, collaborating with philosophers, I think, is extremely valuable in terms of asking good questions. Uh, in order to understand a problem, you really have to explore it from a whole variety of directions. Uh, 
And uh, philosophers have a way of thinking intensely about a particular issue and come up with very good questions about things and can help direct what the neuroscientists will be doing. In my own experience, I've already uh, done certain experiments that I wouldn't have even thought of doing if I hadn't interacted with uh, one of the philosophers uh, here in this group. Oh, uh, well, one of the advantages is really uh, that you're able to uh, do a division of labor. So good philosophers who know a lot about free will can help at that end of things, sort of the uh, conceptual end of things, the history of the subject. And good neuroscientists who know a lot about neuroscience can uh, help to design studies that can uh, give us information about things we want to know. So I think that, I think the collaborative. Oh, there was a second part to the question. <clears throat> Yeah, and the challenges will be in working together, really just uh, normal interpersonal challenges, like uh, make sure you respect what the other person says, uh, try to be clear in what you're saying, and so on. I don't, I don't think it's a special problem. Well, I suppose that, that, that's a, a bit similar to the, to the second question. Um, so I, the, the, the advantages uh, of working together are the ones that I, well, I suppose that um, what I said in, in answer to the first question is that b both disciplines uh, do not have the tools available of the, of the other disciplines. So philosophers uh, don't have the experimental data. They only work with concepts uh, that are rooted in a folk psychological uh, understanding of the world. That's how, what we start with. Uh, but what they do have is that the careful conceptual analysis of these concepts, uh, whereas Empirical scientists, on the other hand, uh, often do not have the time in their, in their everyday life to think carefully about the nature of concepts, uh, but they do generate data which, might be, which are often very surprising, uh, and the surprising data help uh, the theorizing. So they're, they're, this is an advantage that both, both disciplines have very different strengths and weaknesses, uh, and they can complement each other uh, in using the strengths. and uh, and making the, the weaknesses slightly less prominent. The, at the same time, this creates uh, lots of problems because uh, it's very difficult to talk to each other uh, because we have these different strengths and, 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 and weaknesses. Uh, we don't have the same vocabularies and uh, that creates tensions uh, and feelings of not being taken seriously. So uh, I uh, grew up as a philosopher, as it were, I did my PhD in a, in a psychological institution. Uh, and my uh, PhD advisor, a famous psychologist, uh, he wrote a polemic about why he thought that philosophers uh, and neuroscientists or cognitive scientists should go separate ways because he felt so unfairly treated by the philosophers who didn't do any real experimental work but who nevertheless felt like uh, their, their views were so important that they, had, uh, that they could criticize uh, what people in the lab were doing. Uh, and yeah, trying to get over these, I think often social science, social um, elements is the, is the most difficult part in the cooperation. So um, I've, I had training in both disciplines. Um, so both philosophy and neuroscience. And so I see great value in uh, collaborating between these two disciplines. I think that one, if one wants to study free will, uh, one better know the philosophical debates and arguments around this uh, issue. This is a specific tof topic where you want to collaborate with philosophers because of the major conceptual issues that are uh, at play here. And for philosophers as well, I think that in this day and age, um, you can do philosophy uh, of volition without knowing neuroscience, but that would limit your scope tremendously. So I think the greatest advantage is that both disciplines would improve themselves if they would interact with the other discipline. And I think our science would be better, and I think our philosophy would be better. The greatest challenge is to find the common language. So what should be the common currency in this type of, of discussion? How philosophers can speak with neuroscientists in a language that neuroscientists would understand and how neuroscientists would do the same. So that means that we have to take the terms, the professional terms of each discipline and find a way to translate them into the other field. I'm sure that we can do it, but I think this is the greatest challenge. And also, I spoke before about 
uh, finding the right questions. So I think it would also be a challenge to define the questions in a way that is interdisciplinary. So philosophers have their own questions and scientists have another way of asking questions and we need to find a new way to ask questions in a way that would be meaningful both for philosophy and for neuroscience. Well, the educations are so awfully different. I mean, so I've heard people at the conference here in stress ways in which they were Similar, and there certainly are similarities, desire for clarity and rigor and close logical reasoning and so on. But if you're trained in the laboratory sciences and if you're trained uh, in a purely theoretical um, discipline like uh, philosophy, your whole, I think, approach to problems can be extremely different. Uh, this, there has to be some way uh, for people on the purely theoretical side and on the laboratory side to cross this gulf. Happily, the most uh, neuro uh, neuroscientists are not purely experimentalists. Some of them have great, th have deep theoretical interests too, and it's in this area where they have the theoretical interests that I think there's the possibility of the closest collaboration between uh, scientists and philosophers. I should say too, many philosophers have deep interests in the theoretical uh, sorry, in the um, empirical discoveries uh, about the brain that I mentioned in my answers to the, in my answer to the, the first question. The advantages are that we can uh, understand each other from the different points of view, so the different backgrounds, and uh, make, for example, the philosophers can help uh, the scientists to define their concepts better and keep to the uh, relate to traditional ways of, of using the, the concepts in free will issues and consciousness and so forth. Uh, intention uh, and uh, desires, etc. All these kind of words that philosophers have been working with for a long time can perhaps be better uh, uh, communicated with the scientist how to to use the words and also to ask questions that in a way that uh, scientists perhaps are not so used to in the, in the same way as philosophers are and at the same time the neuroscientist can inform the philosophers on what what can be done and what is experimental approaches uh, what can they add to philosophical issues and uh, the, the link between reality and mind, if you like, is better. That's, a, that's a, an advantage. A challenge is, of course, that we don't understand each other, that we use different languages, that we, we have coming from different uh, traditions. And uh, these traditions are like different cultures or different languages. And it, uh, it's often a problem to, to have people coming from different uh, language bases or cultures, scientific cultures or disciplines to talk to each other and uh, understand each other. Often you talk side by side or you, you don't, don't get through with your communication. So I think that the communication is a big challenge. There, I think I'm just going to answer based on experience. So in my research group, I've had three uh, young people who have had a good training in philosophy and have come to me after a PhD in philosophy and have said, I want to think about data, I want to think about doing experiments, I want to think about studying these problems, not purely theoretically, but as they unfold in, in our behavior. And in all three cases, those are people who've joined my lab, who've learned some experimental methods, who've done their own research work and have really taken on board the different methods and have learned a lot. And one of the main things that we've jointly learned in all three cases is that actually a good experiment is very similar to a conceptual analysis. Well, I already mentioned the difficulty of getting them to talk to each other, so now I'll add another difficulty, and that is getting them to agree on the same standards. Uh, neuroscientists say a paper is not good unless it has this and this and this and this and this. And the philosophers say, oh, no, no, no. For a paper to be good, it's got to have these other things, you know, that and that and that and that and that. Uh, and so 
they need to agree on what's going to be a good paper or what's going to be a good experiment or they're not going to both be invested in it and they're not going to be able to work together uh i think one of the biggest challenges is that we we speak different languages so i've had lots of great conversations with uh philosophers but they always they always end up with lots of question asking in both directions so what do you mean by that uh i get asked and what do you mean by that i ask them and it's sort of like we have these different these totally different vocabularies um and it it can take a while to sort of get into that other person's world and understand what they mean and and then it's sort of illuminating then you you see something from a different perspective but it takes work uh it 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 takes effort uh and i think that's one of the biggest challenges so i think i answered that question when i was answering the other questions uh advantages you can get it more uh the concepts would be more clearly defined and the 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 results that you would get would be considered valid by both philosophers and neuroscientists the challenges is again getting along uh getting uh being able to uh talk to each other rather than past each other uh, not getting frustrated by the fact that we speak different languages and so on um i do um i i i you know from a philosophical point of view you know i'm i'm i believe in a school of thought of compatibilism even though the world is deterministic like endless cause effects chains i do believe that that is not uh incompatible with the notion that a human being can have free will and uh it's i think it will take a lot uh, this is not shared by many people that point of view but i personally see no uh disagreement between assuming that the world is physical and at the same time uh that uh my experience of having free will actually is uh a real experience at least and i think that's all we can say about free will right now yes that's my view we we but then again not necessarily ab- in an absolute sense i think we have free will up to a point but there are of course all kinds of our perhaps even our unconscious uh, factors desire feelings all kinds of things can determine the content of our will so my personally i think if we really want to become more free we have to maybe through things like meditation we have to really learn to become aware of the even if you like the deeper layers of the mind and a kind of a self knowledge and in that sense increase our degree of freedom of our will and responsibility of course comes with it i think we have a certain kind of freedom uh we capable of voluntary action uh whether that's free will as some people conceive of it probably not do we have free will uh as other people conceive of it yes do we have enough free will for moral institution for moral practice for legal institutions um yeah i would say we do i do but as i say it's a complex notion and so i think there are conceptions of free will that we don't have certain dualist conceptions but i think we have something which is recognizably what we mean when we're not ordinarily talking about free will no i don't uh i uh i'm a fierce uh, reductionist uh i don't think there's any such thing as, uh, as 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 free will i think we're nothing but a pack of neurons i think all of our volitional decisions will ultimately uh be able to explain uh will will be able to explain all of them uh based on neurons and and, and their interactions there's nothing that transcends the laws of physics uh there's nothing uh that's uh um, that there goes beyond uh, uh the, the basics of, uh, of 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 scientific scrutiny yes of course we have free will <laughs> uh that is i think we have free will and i think we all think we have we all believe that we have free will although some skeptical theorist believe that they disbelieve in in free will that is it um uh, you one can have a sort of uh, reflective second order belief denying the reality um uh, of free will but all of us were we're wired if you like to believe that we are free um and we we could scarcely imagine i think uh inhabiting our social environment our our relationships with one another without believing of ourselves and of other cognitively intact adult human beings uh that much of what we do 
uh, is under our control um, such that we um, can be properly be held morally responsible for what we do. Um, so uh, I, I think that's just part of the human condition to, to understand ourselves in those terms, whether it's true or not. Um, I think it depends on what you mean by free will. Uh, I think there is um, a number of different things people mean by free will. Uh, some of them, I think, um, ultimately are not coherent. So I think some of what some people think have in mind uh, looks to me like something like a square circle, so a, a kind of thing that, that, that there just couldn't be. Um, uh, sometimes what people have in mind, I think, would require us to not be worldly so I don't think and I, I think we're worldly so um, so I don't think we have that kind of free will but some of what people have in mind by free will uh, has to do with whether we can affect changes in the world in accordance with our own um, plans and also whether we're such that we could be morally responsible and I think uh, we have both of those often not always sometimes we do sometimes we don't but um, but we often do as I have said a number of times, my, my view is that it depends upon the definition. Uh, almost uh, all of the issues that we talk about depend upon the definition that you want to use. Uh, years ago, I must say, I, I used an internal definition for myself in which I felt that it didn't exist. But uh, the definition that I now use, I think that I can accept that it exists and to be uh, specific in that regard, the definition that I'm using now is whether the brain is able to function freely without any coercion or uh, significant process like a seizure that might interfere with its processing. So if the brain can function normally, uh, then I believe that in that sense, the brain is free and the brain is free in relation to free will. Yeah, that's a good one. Uh, I've written a lot of books and articles on free will, and what I usually do is give people uh, two different options for what free will is. It's always going to be the ability to act freely, so the options are uh, free action. Here's one set of sufficient conditions. Uh, a person is sane and rational, well-informed, makes a decision on the basis of good information in the absence of coercion any monkey business like that, that would be sufficient uh, for free action. On that conception of it, yes, I believe in free will. On another conception, you have to add to that mix uh, indeterminism in the human brain so that the laws that govern brain activity are not uh, exceptionless, but rather just probabilistic. Uh, if that is what free will requires, then I think it's an open question whether we have it. I don't know whether we do or not, so I'm neutral on that. We clearly have very well, uh, but I think actually that particular question doesn't really require any uh, neuroscientific input because uh, I do think that especially what has been meant by that question uh, in, in the past is a question uh, about the compatibility of free will and determinism. And we can sort that out on conceptual grounds. And I think, yeah, we can, we can say in all confidence, we have free will. <laughs> uh, I think we have free will. Yes, I think we have free will. I don't know. I prefer not to um, say yes or no to a question that I have no good answer to. I hope that in the course of our investigation, I might have a better uh, uh, answer. But I think it heavily depends on how you define free will. I don't think the question is well defined. As I said, there are numerous definitions of free will. I think in some sense, uh, uh, it's as some people have explained the term, no, we don't have free will. As others have explained the term, yes, we do. Uh, for example, if you mean by free will that when someone is trying to make a decision between all two alternatives, that person is able to perform both of the alternatives. Yeah, in that sense, I think we have free will. If you mean that there's some magical uh, power to contravene the laws of nature, uh, no, I don't think we have free will in that sense.
I think uh, we have free will. I think it would, it's hard to understand how we could not have free will. I mean, uh, uh, I, th I think that there's nothing in science that I would say uh, are, is evidence enough to say that free will cannot exist. I mean, our notion that uh, free will cannot exist is often uh, based on uh, the idea that physics says that w the world is deterministic or we have only uh, determinism and, and chance, randomness, as the only ways of explaining the world. But um, we have sort of neglected the possibility that there is something else as an explanatory, uh, has an explanatory power. So I think that uh, free will is a precondition for being a human and it's very much linked to consciousness. I think consciousness and free will go, to get, go together and right? you cannot really separate those two. So I think we have something. I want to understand what it is that we have. I think our actions are not merely reflexes triggered by the immediate sensory input, or at least not all our actions are like that. So I want to understand where those non-reflexive actions come from. Whether you then want to call them, quote, free will, unquote, that would be up to you. I think I probably would not use that term until I had to. But I think that studying what it is that makes our actions flexible and expressive and interesting is a pretty important scientific enterprise. Well, that depends on what you mean by free will. I'm a philosopher. I've got to say that. So I think it, if free means free from causation, then no, I don't think we have free will because none of our acts are free from causation. All of our acts are in fact caused. But if free means free from constraint, I get to do what I want to do, then we do have freedom in that sense. And so if you ask me, do we have free will or not? I got to ask you, what exactly do you mean by that? And then I can answer your question. But if you ask it in general, we're going to get nowhere. I believe that we have free will. Uh, but if you ask me what I think, I'm not sure. That's of course a difficult question. Um, I think it depends on the definition of free will. If Personally, I cannot see how we have some kind of very much very libertarian free will um, where whenever there's a decision, the world stops, you step out of the world, you think about it, you make a decision, then the world continues and you move on. But I also do think that our conscious, uh, um, our conscious thoughts, wants, deliberations, uh, uh, um, um, decisions and so on do affect our actions. So to that respect, I do think that we do have conscious control over our actions. So to, in that respect, I do think that we have free will. So it's, again, a nuanced answer to a nuanced question.